Maestro Christoph Eschenbach, the National Symphony's sixth music director, is with me this evening. Uh, Maestro, thank you very much for uh, accepting the offer to, to speak with me, and it is truly an honor for it me. It was at most pleasure. Oh, thank you. You just returned with the National Symphony from a five-country, 11-city, 12-concert tour, performing Brahms, Beethoven, Schubert, Wagner, Rouse, Penderecki, Weber, Dvorak, and Grieg. A lot. <laughs> How are you feeling? I feel wonderful. I feel um, not at all tired. I feel um, uh, very inspired by the playing of the orchestra. You've been touring for decades with orchestras. What makes you want to keep, keep doing it? Isn't it really very, very hard work? Or is this the, the food for life? That's what it is, the food for life. It's this, um, I mean, every concert is, uh, is a highlight of life for me, every concert. And um, I also construct, so to say, um, the concert event so that I, for me, uh, and I hope for the musicians also, but that it first of all for me be a highlight. Why music is still so burning for me and burning in me. Uh, thank God it is. And I don't know why, but it is. Because from the beginning on, when I heard my first music in my foster mother's house, it was an uh, exploration for me to uh, express myself. And that is still today, it's the same. It's the same burning desire to express myself. Some people ask me why I conduct so much, you know, so um, and traveling, uh, so traveling is annoying, that's for sure. But uh, I, have to, I have to perform, I have to speak music through my gestures, through my arms, through my musicians. And, and uh, this will, I will never leave. visited some outstanding halls in Vienna, Hamburg, Munich, Berlin. How do you feel in, in these cities? Well, I'm used to these halls, I must say. I've been to the concertas in Vienna many, many times, uh, in the Philharmonie in Berlin many times. I have done my only audition for a conductor in the Philharmonie in Berlin, that was Karajan, in '60. For. What was it like to play with Karyan? Oh, it was wonderful. He was very, very kind. He was very kind to his soloists and I must say very kind to his orchestra. sagen, die Wichtigkeit, die diese ersten zwei Crescendi haben. Deswegen tun Sie nicht den Ton rasch hinbringen, sondern bereiten Sie ihn vor. Und dann nicht einen neben den anderen setzen, sondern die zwei verbinden. Bitte, kann ich denn nur diesen das kleine Detail haben? He was maybe the first of the non-dictatoric conductors. Also, of course, a great personality. So, but I never have heard him scream at the orchestra or say bad things. 
the musicians. Say that he was somewhat of a role model for you as a conductor? In a way, yes, because I, I went to many, many uh, rehearsals with him and um, at this time one was not allowed, conductors didn't allow students or even not students, uh, I was much further already uh, to attend rehearsals. But he allowed me the same as Georges Zell did, with whom I also worked a lot. He was a very different type of conductor. You see, that's good. If you give any more, the bassoons are bound to sound a little ridiculous because they cannot possibly match that. Besides, they don't want to force, since they are aware of an intonation problem. <laughs> from you is to, to um, involve really totally, of course, with the ears accompanying, but here playing totally in the piece emotionally. You also have a gentle demeanor up on the podium. You don't, you don't yell, you don't, you don't glare. Was this always your style? It was always my style because I'm saying to myself, why should I scream? Uh, and uh, and uh, shock somebody by screaming uh, to make things better. I can do it in another way. Of course, you have to have a certain authority. You have to uh, do. You have to know what you want to hear from your musicians, but you uh, take it from them in 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 a, in, a, in a gentle way. You know, but demanding at the same time demanding because otherwise you did don't get your wish fulfilled how you want to hear a score. What was it like to return to your birthplace to conduct in Wrocław, Poland? Oh, that's of course very, very moving for me because um, I had been there once after uh, my childhood. I left uh, Breslau at this time called Breslau, Silesia, Schlesien, in uh, January 1945, so I was just not yet five years old. And um, then I was only once there in 2000. And in 2000 the city was still um, not in very good shape. And in these last 15, 16 years, it's amazing how it changed. It's so beautiful now. It is really um, uh, restored to the old, to its old image, I think. And uh, my father was professor music for musicology there at the university, one of the three oldest universities existing. And um, he was also a chorus conductor. He had a um, a chorus from all over Silesia. They, they gathered in Breslau and under his direction they sang in the very beautiful hall in the um, uh, university, the Leopoldina. He conducted everything, choral thing existing from Bach to uh, to over Verdi, to Liszt, and to at this time modern composers. You touch a very uh, important point of my of my uh, life with that concert in Breslau, which we did, because um, it's something something special to be in the city where 
you were born. What is your earliest musical memory? I grew up with my grandmother. And my grandmother, not only having lost her daughters through my birth, who was a pianist, uh, had also lost earlier her son, who was uh, 15 years old, but uh, as everybody said, wonderfully playing the violin. Uh, she didn't hear music anymore. So anyway, one didn't have records at this time. Uh, she didn't play herself. There was a piano which my mother used to play, and I tink, tink, tempered on it a bit, and it fascinated me. But my first uh, memories of music are when I got to the house of my foster mother, who was a cousin of my mother, and was also a pianist and a singer. And I was very, very sick for a year um, when she found me in a refugee camp and brought me to her house. But I heard every night uh, her playing. So, and she played every night. And she taught during the day, and she played for herself. She played uh, Bach and Beethoven and, and Schumann and Rachmaninoff and Chopin. Where in your life did the important teachers come into play? First of all, my foster mother. He was a very, she was a very, very, very good teacher, still into a very, very old age, she, and she specialized in teaching children. And it's very difficult to teach children well, you know, to, you know. It was not difficult with me because I had such a, such a passion to play. But then with a teacher to whom I went after my high school, you know, you call it, no? Huh? years, and that was a, a Romanian lady, uh, Elisa Giul Hansen, and she went to Berlin in the 20s to study with Schnabel, and later on also, also a bit with Fischer, Edwin. So, uh, and this is there my piano playing roots. Schnabel uh, going back to his teacher Bart, and Bart, same teacher for Rubinstein, by the way, um, going back to Liszt. And Liszt uh, going back to Czerny, and Czerny to Beethoven. So my teacher always said, I'm, I'm an ascendant of Beethoven. <laughs> When I was 11, my foster parents took me to a concert of the Berlin Philharmonic with Fortwängler. And I was so overwhelmed by the sound I heard there and that these musicians who played like, uh, I always say, like, like devils and angels together. And this very weird man causing all that, you know. Uh, so I said, I was. My mother saw that and she, she, I said, I want to be a conductor. And my mother said, well, if you want to be a conductor, then the piano is not enough because it's not an orchestra instrument. You have to learn an orchestra instrument. And as my foster father was an amateur violinist, uh, I got a violin and I got violin lessons. Yeah, I played the Mendelssohn concerto and I played the, the, the Viotti and Berio and these school concertos and, and Beethoven and, and very much chamber music because in, in that house of my foster parents uh, one gathered for four evenings a week to make chamber music and soon I played the viola in the quartet because I love to play the middle, be in the middle, the middle voices. Was there a pianist out there that you heard that may have sparked you to greater heights? Oh yes, yes. <clears throat> Especially one, which was Edwin Fischer. He was a giant as a pianist. And I heard him uh, rather many times. And in the 50s, when I st uh, when I was not yet studying, but, but I went to Hamburg for my study, for my child studies, piano, 
uh, in these uh, days and I uh, heard Fisher's name. Uh, another pianist uh, I didn't like so much was Gieseke. I found him rather cold, <laughs> didn't touch me, but Fisher struck like this. And um, then a little later, Rudolf Serkin, I thought, think, still think, is one of the greatest pianists ever lived. Rubenstein ever come into to your uh, to your field of vision? Of course, a little later. In, I heard Rubenstein only in the seventies, but I will never forget one concert for, of him. For, for example, in London, where he played three concerti on one evening: the second Saint Sans, the fourth uh, Beethoven, and the first Brahms. Can you imagine? <laughs> It was a long evening, but it was also an enormous uh, um, uh, task for pianist. And he was like a, like a young man. And he was uh, beginning beginning of eighties, I think, at this time. It was unbelievable. play at all? Of course. Yes. With Vladimir Horvitz, I played in his house for him. When, you, when I said I did on, only one audition for a conductor, then I, that was not an audition. It was just that uh, Giancarlo Menotti, who was uh, through the Toscanini family, a kind of uh, family member of the Horvitz's, introduced me to him in New York. <laughs> It was just at the end of my first uh, uh, big American tour as a pianist. And uh, I had done my last concert in, in, in New York and I, I decided to, to, to stay another week, but not playing piano, just go to museums and see the city and whatever, I'd, uh, visit uh, people I knew. And then after a week, uh, Menotti called me and said, Horowitz wants to see you tonight. See, fine, but uh, I cannot play. I have not practiced since eight days. I mean, you don't play for Horowitz when you have not practiced. So we arrived there, and uh, Menotti left, went to another party, so I was alone with this giant. <laughs> and I said, I mean, it's wonderful to, to be with you, but I don't play. Don't expect. Said, oh, yes, he said, you. Yes, Menotti told me so much about you. Why don't you play a little bit? He said, no, I don't play. And then with his big grin, he said, I don't bite. <laughs> so I played. So finally I played some Mozart and some Schubert. And he sat there uh, on a sofa and listened, and here was the piano. <laughs> Ah. 
was so impressive in this apartment. There was this sofa with this big Picasso clown, over the, the red clown. And then there was a Degas, the, the riders, the jockey rider. And there was Monet. And then there was in, another Degas. It was so wonderful. Then I saw on his, his table many books about Schumann and also letters from Clara and Robert and also um, Chrysler, the, the Edea Hoffmann and, uh, and I said, you, and they are, were all in German. Uh, you read this? We don't write so much about Schumann. I said, yes, I have to make a recording in, in a few weeks of Schumann works, of Chrysler Jana and of the uh, F minor concerto, concert sans, sans orchestre. Then he said, "Oh, I, but I have injured my, my little finger, and I don't know if I can play. Uh, if I can play, I have to play in, in five days in Boston, and this is weird." And just with this Krasnayana, oh, Krasnayana is also on the record, yeah, Krasnayana, and. Um, he, the first piece of class uses always this little finger concept, like the, and forcefully so, and uh, and he. He said, um, wait a moment, I, I have to make a new bandage around it. And the very moment he went to the bathroom, made, come with a bandage, then he sat down at the piano and began to play Krasnayana. And after the first piece, this fell off. <laughs> and he played through the whole Krasnayana. Now I was sitting on the sofa and he played. And then, after that, he played also a wonderful Haydn sonata. And I was just mesmerized. Mesmerized. Give me an impression. The first one is Dmitry Shostakovich. Shostakovich uh, came rather late into my life. That means the door to Shostakovich opened rather late. That had to do that in our uh, student years we had a, a priest, a pope of music, a musicologist, uh, Adorno, who was teaching us just about new composers, uh, post Webern composers, who was very well taught the principles of uh, Schoenberg's. Uh, twelve tone music and uh, and and the the second Viennese school and so on and so on. He hated Shostakovich and told us that. So we kind of being the adapts of him didn't touch him or 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 when we touched the score, then we looked very critical uh, at the score uh, from the terms of twelve tone music, which is not. And also Prokofiev, he didn't like uh, uh, Rachmaninoff, he was calling Tkitsch. And Sibelius was totally out of his, his taste frame. But his taste frame was very small. But then, of course, later I discovered Shostakovich myself, and now I'm really uh, addicted to his music. His music is so deep and so full of, uh, of uh, the experience of suffering, political suffering also, which, which uh, formed and, and, and formed his character and, and his soul. And uh, this comes out in his music and is enormously uh, um, moving for me and enormously strong. How about 
Pierre Boulez. So this was one of Adorno's uh, big young people at this time. Uh, Darmstadt School, Donauer Esching and so on. Um, to stay in the tradition of the Vini school and the European school was too much. And I wanted to have another world. And I am very sensitive to generally to the sound. I think sound should be a, a very important part of the music and not only something you add superficially afterwards. So therefore, I mean, you can find uh, in my work, for instance, uh, in the Malarmé uh, improvisations, you can see a different sound also. And I got to know uh, him very well uh, on a very tragic event. And that was in Cleveland when Zell was dying. And Zell was supposed to conduct the Blossom Center, the summer festival, a Mozart concerto, the coronation concerto with me. And uh, Boulez jumped in. He was, Zell was very in favor of Boulez as a conductor. And uh, uh, I played with him the coronation concerto. And we got along very well. And uh, then he uh, engaged me with the New York Philharmonic in the 70s and, uh, and when I was uh, back in Paris and he back in Paris uh, we got to know each other really well and, and he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, human being really great um, mind I tried to, to join two parts of the musical, musical world which were before incompatible and even uh, looking at each other with a kind of distance. Uh, I don't think that uh, Schoenberg was very, very, not friendly, but I mean, well, agreed with the, with the point of view of Debussy, which he found certainly uh, too, too free. And you read in any way, you know, literature and art and what have you. And uh, he seemed in the first years rather narrow in his musical taste. In the first years, uh, I knew him in the 70s. But opened more and more up when, as a conductor also. Uh, to the end, when I had a year and a half of dinner with him, uh, we talked also about Strauss, Richard Strauss, and I, and I knew that he liked Elektra and Salome. Uh, but uh, then I touched very carefully the Rosenkavalier and he said, oh, that's a very good sc score, but I tell you, one of the best scores of the 20th century is Ariadne. And then I was really stunned because before I would not have thought that he liked Strauss. And so, to, 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 in other words, he, he opened during his life, he opened very much his, the whole scope of his taste, musical taste. He was a great man. But Dmitri Metropolis? Unfortunately, I didn't know him, didn't hear him live, because he died too early, died in 1960. And, uh, but I no many, many recordings of him. And I think even through the recordings, he's fiery. <laughs> Exciting, he is. Uh, mm, he reads the scores in a very, very uh, brilliant, new, and crisp way. 
the, like the Mahler symphonies, for, for example. And um, Verklärte Nacht, Schönberg, incredible. And uh, I'm a great, great, great admirer of him. Did you know Leonard Bernstein? I got to know him when my pianist life already faded, so to say. And I didn't play anymore with other conductors. He was often at my then house. I had a, I had a house at that time in the Canary Islands. And I invited him there, and he, he came actually regularly there, also when I was not there, and composed and felt very well. And um, he was enormously um, uh, cultured man. And he uh, could recite you long uh, passages from Goethe's Faust in German, for example, or he could uh, uh, sing in his own way of music making, in his own chant. He knew the Bible enormously well and could very well talk about it and, uh, and uh, interpret it. And that fascinated me, absolutely. a lot to say when it comes to the music of Mahler and Bruckner. Not so often that conductors um, love both these two composers equally, and I, I do. Uh, Bruckner is, for me, a, it has to do with architecture. One talks often about uh, cathedrals. It's for me to build something and to build it from one cell to, to a huge building. Whereas with, with Mahler, it's, it's very different. Mahler uh, it turns me on, so to say, with his emotions. I mean, uh, it's not by chance that Mahler and, uh, was qu quasi a neighbor of Freud in Vienna or w was living in the, in the, and composing mostly in the first 10 years of the uh, 20th century, where psychoanalysis was bl uh, blossoming and was uh, all of a sudden on the table, which was not before. And th that... Uh, said uh, this uh, aspect interests me in, and speaks to me in Mahler. <laughs> This is psychological music. It is music what what um, concerns us, uh, our nervous system, and our nervous thinking, and our dreams, and but in a very pure and direct way. And people didn't understand that at this time. Therefore, he said, "My time will come, and now is his time." Do you read reviews? Do, does it affect you? Well, there is a big problem. There's a very, very big problem. We, you, all your colleagues in the orchestra, me, we know our scores much better than the critic who goes every night, or every second night, or every third night. In the big cities, they go every night to another concert, you know, and have to go. And they find it also... Uh, really a burden to do that. Uh, how can they know all these pieces as well as we know? We know them by memory. You know, we, we, we study them, we, we, we rehearse them, we uh, rehearse them together, and we know them better. So therefore, this is the biggest uh, dilemma in, in that profession, I think. And 
how do you deal with it? Well, I mostly don't read them. What's a very good day for you? A very good day for me is that if I begin the day to play an hour by Bach, like washing myself, my mind, wash, inside wash, <laughs> inside baths, uh, and put things in me in the right order, in the right direction, and then I can do anything in this day and it will go well. I, I cannot think of one piece which is not the best. They're all the piano pieces, the English suites, the French suites, the partitas, the Wolterberete Clavier, for example, this is a, it's a Bible. 230 some odd concerts into your tenure here. What would you like your legacy to be? I tried in these six years to open the orchestra, open their minds to any kind of music, an opening towards movement in music, towards phrasing in music, towards diction in music, towards transparency. Uh, you will uh, hear me in my rehearsals often uh, to interrupt and say that is too loud versus that, or that could be, uh, that should be heard and not covered, and so on. Um, the, the awareness and the opening of the ears and the minds. What plans do you have now in the next uh, several years? Do you have some? Do you have a project that you uh, that you have been wanting to get to? Will you have time to get to it? I have one big project, which begins in two years and goes for four years. This is with the Vienna Philharmonic to record and uh, and tele record also the nine Bruckner symphonies in nine uh, different cathedrals in Europe. In nine different countries. Maybe not in nine countries, but in at least five or six, uh, but in different uh, cathedrals. In Europe, one talks always about economy, about money. Now, now Europe is anyway in a very, very big trouble politically. And nobody speaks about culture. And that would be a European cultural project, a big one. Some might say that you're at an age where, where maybe perhaps uh, you know, a nice relaxation on, uh, in a vacation spot on the beach would be preferable. I hate beaches. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I hate beaches because uh, too much sand gets into my book what I want to read or in my score what I want to learn. <laughs> uh, I have always to be kind of busy in my mind. Uh, I cannot, I cannot um, sort of relax like other people relax in vacation. When I, when I go to a vacation, I go to interesting landscapes or whatever, and, uh, or to the sea with a boat and, 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 and... I wish you the very best with the with these projects. I'm sure they will be successful. And thank you for your thoughts this evening. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a concert in 45 minutes. Uh, where, where you've programmed uh, two Prokofiev uh, symphonies, uh, the Classical Symphony and the Symphony Number no. 5. And I very much look forward to this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Wonderful time. to talk to you. Thank you.